Good morning, welcome to the K webinar for Wednesday the 2nd of December. Today we are looking at recent changes and updates to fire safety standards with John Davidson. If you've joined us already, you'll know by now, but my name is Jordan and I'm the Regional and Student Services Coordinator here at CAPE. I will be the moderator for today's session. We do like to make these interactive, so we do encourage you to send in any questions that you may have. You can do this via the questions panel that is appearing on your screen. If you are watching on YouTube, you can still send in your questions. Um, do this via emailing us on webinars at cbld.com or you can tweet us using the hashtag CAVECPD. So your presenter today is John Davidson. John is the Head of Field Operations at the National Security Inspectorate. John leads NSI's team of 26 expert auditors operating in the UK and Ireland, assessing companies against the requirements of NSI security schemes and the BFAE fire certification schemes. He also ensures NSI maintains its UCAS accreditation as its certification body in these disciplines. The team delivers in the region of 2,500 inspection slash audit days per year with oversight of over 1,200 fire safety and security system providers and alarm receiving centres. He is engaged in the development of BSI standards and represents NSI on FSH12 and FSH12 over 1 and is involved in the development of BS8629 and the revision of PAS79. John is also a member of a number of BF, BAFE scheme development groups. John is a member of the Institution of Engineering and Technology, the Institute of Fire Safety Managers, and a specialist member of the International Institute of Risk and Safety Management. He is also a registered IRCA Principal Auditor and a practitioner of the Chartered Quality Institute. With that, if you give me just a couple of seconds, I'm going to hand over to John now and he can go through his presentation with you. Hi, good morning. And uh, thank you for attending today's webinar, which I hope you'll find useful. Uh, just to recap, I think Jordan covered most of uh, what I was about to say on my first slide. So, as you said, I'm head of field operations for the systems division at NSI and responsible for a team of 26 auditors uh, throughout uh, throughout the UK. Sorry, I had a slight technical hitch there. And I've been involved with the fire and security industry since 1982. And as Jordan has said, apart from my day job at NSI, I also sit on several BSI and BAFE committees and was a member of the PAS 79 revision group and the BS 8629 and BAFE SP 206 and 207 development groups. The aim of today's presentation is to give you a brief update on some of the changes that have been taking place to fire safety standards and fire certification schemes. Just a little bit of background on NSI. As you can see from the slide there, we are a UCAS accredited third party certification body and all NSI approved companies are regularly assessed to ensure they are competent to deliver the required service. And certification by a UCAS accredited third party um, certification body provides evidence of your chosen provider's competency. Sorry, Jordan, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Hi, Jordan. Yeah, sorry. Can can you see my full screen, Jordan? Can the audience see my full screen? Or are yes. they my note screen? No, can't see your notes. We can see your presentation. Okay, thank you. Sorry for that. I was I was having a yeah. bit of a technical problem here. Sorry, thank you. Right. Not a problem. <laughs> so, um, as we were saying, yes. Yeah, so, so um, certification by a UCAS accredited third party certification body provides evidence of your chosen provider's competency. 
and also by choosing a third party certificated supplier it helps to demonstrate due diligence in sourcing a competent provider to help meet fire safety obligations and this is going to become increasingly more important in the coming years with the increased focus on competency within the construction industry and also for our approved companies there is an ongoing assessment of competency against latest standards and best working practice as a UCAS accredited certification body we are audited ourselves every year by UCAS to ensure we maintain the highest levels of auditing standards integrity and independence and this provides assurance to end users of the rigor of the audit process that has been applied to each approved company and a mark of this is the UCAS double tick and crown that you can see on the slide there uh, and our companies are able to display this alongside their gold approval to validate their product and quality management competence and for any system or service provided the approved company will issue a certificate of compliance that can be displayed and shown to your insurer and any other relevant enforcing authorities just a quick look at some of the numbers there so we have over 70 accredited alarm receiving centers in the uk we have 400 fire systems companies with nsi approval 900 security systems installers and we have an in-house team of 36 full-time expert auditors who all specialize in security and fire safety we are a, a national police chiefs council so mpcc recognized certification body we are also a security industry authority appointed approved contractor scheme assessing body we are licensed by BAFE to deliver their suite of fire safety schemes and we're also uh, recognized as an assessing body by the surveillance camera commissioner so what i'd like to look at today uh, a few topics here so first of all an overview of the revision of past 79 the code of practice for fire risk assessment then to have a look at the BAFE SP206 scheme for kitchen fire protection systems. And then following on from that, something that is, is very much a, uh, a high profile topic at the moment. And this is the BS8629 standard for evacuation alert systems for use by the fire and rescue service. And following on from that, the BAFE SP207 scheme for evacuation alert systems installed to the requirements of BS 8629 and there should be at the end of the presentation time for uh, questions which I'm, which I'm quite happy to take so first of all let's have a look at the PAS 79 document so PAS 79 was last revised in 2012 and since that time, as you're probably all aware, there have been a number of significant fires, including Grenfell Tower, the Beechmere Care Home in Crewe, and the Cube in Bolton. And all of these fires have caused a significant rethink with regards to fire safety, and especially in relation to high-rise residential buildings. Now, the current past 79 document does not contain any specific guidance the those for those domestic premises or, or parts of domestic premises that are required to have a fire risk assessment carried out under current fire safety legislation so the new document the revised past 79 will be in two parts so part one will cover other uh, premises other than housing and part two will cover housing and the expected date for publication of the revised documents is December 2020 
Now you'll notice that the, the revised document now has the status of a code of practice rather than guidance. Now past 79, 2012 and its predecessor was actually written in the form of a code of practice, but it was entitled Fire Risk Assessment Guidance and Recommended Methodology. But the reason for the change in the published status of past 79 is simply to recognize that guides are not usually written in such a way as to sustain a reliable claim of compliance. It should also be noted that PAS 79 is not intended to constitute a textbook on fire safety, nor is it regarded as a substitute for knowledge of fire safety principles and the practical use and application of fire protection measures, or indeed an understanding of the premises and their features, usage and occupancy. And when carrying out a fire risk assessment, there is likely to be need for reference to other codes of practice so for ex and, and guidance documents. So for exa uh, example, the uh, MHCLG guides and other, other guidance documents on specific aspects of fire prevention, uh, fire protection and, and management of fire safety. And also PAS 79 is not intended to provide guidance on the detailed requirements of relevant fire safety legislation. So just having a, a look at the, uh, uh, the overview of the changes. So part one is effectively the old PAS 79 document, but has a revised scope of fire risk assessments in non-domestic premises and parts of non-domestic premises for which fire risk assessments are required by legislation. So that's the scope of the new part one document. But the scope excludes single family private dwellings because they are not covered under UK fire, fire safety legislation. It also excludes certain houses in multiple occupation, common parts of blocks of flats or masonettes, and sheltered housing. Now, there is often a lot of confusion over the term sheltered housing, extra care housing, and supported housing. So, just for a bit of clarification, within past 79, these premises have now been defined. So, sheltered housing is defined as self contained residential accommodation. Um, and where some form of assistance is available at all times, but not necessarily from persons on the premises. So assistance could be given by means of a telecare system, uh, by speech communication systems. It doesn't mean necessarily that there is a, a warden or someone on site all the time. We then have extra care housing, which is similar to shelter housing, but usually has managed on care, on care site and support services, usually on a 24 hour basis. And then you have supported housing, which is designed for vulnerable people living as part of the community with support that is normally, but not necessarily provided on a 24 hour basis. So part one of the revised pass excludes sheltered housing, extra care housing and support housing. These are all included in the new part two document. Now some principal changes that we have in part one. So there is new guidance on consideration to be given to external wall construction and cladding. Uh, and this was included following the Grenfell Tower fire. There is recognition of pre-occupation fire safety assessments and a clarification to avoid confusion between these assessments and the fire risk assessment to which PAS 79 refers because um, I'm sure that many of the listening will understand that you cannot conduct a satisfactory fire risk assessment until the premises is actually occupied and in use. And sometimes there's confusion between what is a preoccupation assessment and the actual fire risk assessment. 
and there's also greater emphasis on competence of fire risk assessors and reference to future competence standards and this is as a consequence of the Hackett review of building regulations and the subsequent reports published by the competence steering group. So that's an overview of principal changes in part one and so there are quite a number of changes in part one but I need uh, significantly more time to discuss them all in depth. If we now take a look at the part two, so this is a, a new part to pass 79 and the scope of part two is for fire risk assessments in housing premises and those parts of housing premises for which fire risk assessments are required by legislation. And it includes certain houses of multiple occupation, so those that fall within the scope of relevant fire safety legislation. It includes the common parts of blocks of flats or masonettes, again, if they fall under relevant fire safety legislation. It covers sheltered housing, extra care housing, and supported housing. But part two does exclude, again, single family private dwellings because they're not covered under UK fire safety legislation. They exclude premises used solely for short term letting. So we're looking at here a, a residential tenancy of less than six months of a fully furnished property and where the utilities and probably television and internet are included in the rent. It also excludes peer to peer rented accommodation so for example airbnb type accommodation it excludes obviously non-domestic premises because they come under part one and it also excludes residential care homes as as they also come under part one part two also takes into account guidance uh, published by the uh, NFCC um, and, and uh, guidance published in England and Scotland on fire safety in purpose-built blocks of flats and it also takes into account, into account guidance published by the NFCC on fire safety in specialised housing along with equivalent guidance published in Scotland. It gives recommendations for types two, three, and four fire risk assessments in blocks of flats, sheltered housing, and extra care housing. And it also has new guidance on the consideration to be given to external wall construction and cladding following the Grenfell Tower fire. So that is a brief overview of the updates to past 79 as i say it's widely expected that these two documents will be published probably uh mid december okay if we now move on to have a look then at the baif sp206 scheme for kitchen fire protection systems so as you can see there are there are a picture there of some notable fires so there was a Morrison's which uh, was down in Folkestone in Kent uh, that's the the top left picture the top right pictures are pictures of the Randolph, Randolph Hotel uh, in Oxford that was severely damaged by a fire starting in a kitchen and the bottom two pictures as we can see are takeaway premises which were both significantly uh, and in the case of the bottom left was was total write off uh, due to fire. So the actual title of this scheme is the scheme for the design, installation, commissioning, recharge and maintenance of kitchen fire protection systems. The scheme was launched in late 2018 following a number of large loss commercial kitchen fires and food and drink related fires according to fire industry and insurance data these are the third most common cause of large fires and account for nearly 10% of all large loss fires 
And overall, restaurants and cafes account for something in the region of 42% of all fires within the food and drink sector. But why was there a scheme needed? Well, there were, there were several things. First of all, an absolute lack of regulation within the industry with regards to kitchen fire protection systems. There are no British or European standards covering the design, installation, commissioning or maintenance of the systems. The systems are installed and, and designed and commissioned against manufacturers instructions. But a major problem is inadequate maintenance of the systems, very often done by companies not approved by the manufacturers and companies using grey market replacement products. You can only or should only be able to, to source replacement parts and spare parts for these systems if you are an authorised distributor of one of the of one of the manufacturing companies however as we all know the likes of ebay brilliant place for obtaining this stuff and there's a huge problem in the maintenance market with regards to kitchen fire protection systems so how does the scheme work well first of all an applicant company so someone applying to come on the scheme must already be an authorised distributor for a manufacturer and must install systems approved to either LPS 1223 or UL 300. Now those two standards there, 1223 and 300, they are product approval standards for the actual equipment for which the uh, sorry, for which the equipment is manufactured to. So a company applying for the scheme must be for an authorised distributor for a manufacturer that makes LPS 1223 or UL 300 approved systems. The scheme is not a modular scheme, so companies have to be approved for the full scope of work for design, installation, commission, recharge and maintenance. The certificated company has to have named or nominated designers and these are the people who are responsible for signing off system designs and designers and engineers must have undergone manufacturers training and refresher training where appropriate for a company to continue to be an authorised distributor. Now the scheme operates what we have called the, the MOT concept. So in the past, fire systems have been issued with a certificate of compliance on completion, but there really wasn't anything afterwards to confirm the system still met the design requirements and still functioned as it was designed to do so. So now, following approval, a company must issue certificates of compliance for all new kitchen fire suppression systems that are installed, and this confirms that the system has been provided by a third party certificated organisation. And then following a, a routine preventive maintenance visit, a new certificate of compliance must be issued to confirm the system still operates as it was designed to do so. And this provides assurance the work has been correctly completed by a third party certificated or approved company. And also, if there are complaints about the quality of work or the service, to, uh, service provided by an approved company, then we operate a robust and independent complaints process. So what does the issue of a certificate of compliance mean for the user? Well, this confirms that the system has been provided by a third party certificated organisation and this is an assurance that the system has been designed, installed, commissioned and maintained by competent service providers. The scheme also requires that a company has in place a system to uniquely identify the replacement of critical components. And the issue of certificate of compliance is also evidence 
that the end user has applied due diligence when selecting a service provider. Okay. So that was a whistle stop um, overview of the SP206 scheme. So the, the thing to look at now is the new code of practice, the BS8629 2019 code of practice for the design, installation, commission and maintenance of evacuation alert systems for use by fire and rescue services in buildings containing flats. You wouldn't believe how many committee hours were taken up uh, coming up with such a snappy title of standards such as that. Um, and this standard was published on the 30th of November 2019. So why a new standard? Well, no, none of you need to be told what that picture is of. The first thing we need to understand is why was there a requirement for a new standard or indeed a requirement for this type of system? So during the Grenfell Tower fire, once the Fire and Rescue Service had decided to abandon the stay put policy and evacuate the building, it proved almost impossible for the Fire and Rescue Service to implement a total evacuation due to there being no effective means of alerting residents other than firefighters knocking on doors, which in the Grenfell scenario was an impossible task. Grenfell Tower was not fitted with a communal fire alarm system. As you wouldn't expect there to be, this was a building operating a stay put policy. But following the Grenfell Tower fire, two significant things occurred. First of all, there was a review of building regulations in Scotland and the domestic technical handbook was updated to include the requirement to install evacuation alert systems in new build blocks of flats with an accommodation story of more than 18 meters above ground level where a stay put policy is going to be used. So that was the first thing that happened. Secondly, the Grenfell Tower Inquiry Phase 1 report was published and this included a recommendation by Sir Martin Morbick that all high-rise residential buildings with a dwelling story above 18 meters now this is interesting in both existing and new build and where a stay put policy is in operation should be provided with evacuation alert systems so they were the two things that really prompted the development of the 8629 standard and subsequently the development of the BAFE SP207 scheme, which we'll look at in a moment. However, there are some limitations to the use of these systems. So, first of all, they're normally for use in buildings containing flats, so usually high rise over 18 meters. However, this is likely, this, this height of 18 meters is likely to be reduced to 11 meters when approved document B for fire safety is revised. They are not to be used where there's a, a communal fire alarm system. So they're, they're for only using in buildings where there is no communal fire alarm system and the building is operating a stay put policy. And they are not a compensation for reduction in fire protection measures or as mitigation for defects in construction, maintenance or management of a building. I've already spoken to a number of people that are seeing a BS8629 system as a panacea for all the problems they have in their buildings with regards to construction maintenance. And BS8629 systems are definitely not a compensation for those issues. And the thing that, that people need to understand is that these are not fire detection fire alarm systems. These things do not have manual call points. There is no automatic detection on these systems. 
there is purely sounders in the flats and they are not interfaced or integrated with fire alarm or fire detection systems. So what does the system comprise of? So you have the evacuation alert control and indicate indicating equipment or the EC or for the purpose of this presentation we'll just call it the control panel and this has to be sighted internally at an appropriate location for firefighters responding to a fire so normally to what the fire and rescue service would would know as the entry control point the control panel must be housed in a secure cabinet that is only accessible by the fire and rescue service maintenance personnel or premises management and there needs to be at least one sounder in each flat more sounders might be required in larger flats so for example if you have mason nets duplex type flats where you have more than one level of accommodation you may need more sounders to achieve the recommended sound pressure levels but also it's important to note that there are no sounders in the common parts of flats so for example stairwells access corridors access corridors and lift lobbies so there are no sounds in the common parts however some shared use areas so for example nowadays a lot of blocks of flats have rooftop gardens etc those areas may require sounders so that's a brief overview of an 8629 system now leading on from the revision of the Scottish Building Regulations, the recommendation from Sir Martin Moore Bick, and the publication of BS 8629. Leading on from that, the BAFE SP207 scheme for the design, installation, commission, and maintenance of evacuation alert systems uh, was written. So, this scheme was developed in consultation with the Fire and Rescue Service and it was launched in October of this year and we at NSI we were the first certification body to achieve UCAS accreditation to operate the scheme and the first certification of a company to the scheme is expected um, in the early part of this month. So this particular scheme is a modular scheme so companies can gain approval for the scope of work they carry out so for example if a company designs installs commissions and maintains evacuation alert systems they must hold approval for all the modules of work they cannot hold approval for just one element so if a company is carrying out all the work then they must hold approval that entire scope of work and similar to the kitchen fire protection system scheme we looked at earlier this scheme operates the MOT star concept for certificates and certificates of, of compliance are issued on completion of installation and following routine maintenance and under the BS 8629 standard there's a recommendation that these systems are maintained by a servicing organization every six months in the same way as a as a bs 5839 part one fire alarm system it is worth noting that evacuation alert systems will come within the scope of article 38 of the fire safety order and article 38 deals with maintenance of measures provided for protection of firefighters so these these systems will come under or come within scope of article uh, article 38 of the fire safety order and equivalent legislation in scotland and northern ireland so therefore there is a legal requirement to ensure that these systems are maintained in an efficient state and an efficient working order and in good repair by competent persons or competent organizations so 
So now I just want to take a quick look of the benefits of third party certification. As I'm sure many of you will be aware, with the latest reports published by the Competency Steering Group, there is now a huge focus on third party certification across all sectors of the construction industry. Now, all NSI approved companies are regularly assessed to ensure they're competent to deliver the required service. And certification by a UCAS accredited body provides evidence of a chosen provider's competency. And also, by choosing a third party certificated as player, it helps to demonstrate due diligence in sourcing a competent provider to help meet fire safety obligations. And as I said earlier, there is an ongoing competency assessment against latest standards and best working practices for all our approved companies. So that's really the end of the presentation. Thank you for listening. Uh, I hope you found it all useful, uh, but now I'll hand back to Jordan and I'll take some questions if there are any. Thank you, John. Um, so bear with me two seconds. Let me just swap things back over. So um, we've had a couple of questions come in so far. So we'll, I'll ask these ones and then hopefully people will have a chance to send in um, any others that they might have thought of. So bear with me. Let me just open up the little questions tab. So we have um, the first question. In regards to the past 79 updates and the two part system, is this effectively two documents or is it one with relevant sections to complete? And is there going to be a recommended template? So uh, it will be two separate documents. So it will be past 79 part one and past 79 part two. So yes, they are two separate documents. And yes, there will be uh model templates in both parts of the standard uh for fire risk assessments yes lovely thank you okay and then the second one that we've got is um how do you intend to audit the use of enhanced cable being used in bs8629 system so as a certification body there's there's or sorry, for our approved companies uh, dealing with fire alarm systems, et cetera, there's already a requirement for them to use certificated products, so panels, cables, call points, detectors, et cetera. So during our audits, we will be looking to see uh, what cable the company has used and looking to, to ensure that that cable has third party certification against the relevant test standards. So there will be a a huge focus on the use of enhanced cabling for evacuation alert systems. Hope that answers it. Brilliant. Okay. So in terms of <laughs> in terms of questions, um, that's all that we've actually had come through. So I'm taking that okay. as you answered everyone's questions during your presentation. <laughs> so we've just had a comment come in actually um thank you for a clear and precise introduction to these new or updated fire safety documents thank you um so if there aren't any more questions then i'll just um wrap up with just a couple of mentions from things from hq um so we have recently launched two new online training um courses so if you are interested in any um, extra CPD, I believe the two new e-learning courses um, are on our website, so please go and take a look. Um, we have also um, listed all of our regional AGMs. Um, so these are happening um, during January and the first week of February. They'll all be held via Microsoft Teams. Um, with CPD attached to them as well. So it's just a good opportunity to get to speak to your committees and um, the HQ representatives as well for any updates from here. Um, please do also keep an eye out for some virtual training. Um, we have recently held certificate and building control online successfully, and we have now released dates for the next couple of months um, for other courses as well. So please go and have a look on our website. 
Um, so with that, I just want to thank John for his presentation this morning and thank everyone who has um, joined us as well. Um, I hope you all stay safe for the remainder of 2020. Um, if you have any comments or further questions, just email them over to me and I'll be more than happy to share them with John. Um, so with that, please stay safe and hopefully I will see you all online again in 2021. Thank you, Jordan.